When you hear the word urban street, what kind of image comes into mind? Is it something like this? No, not really. How about this? Yeah, this is more like it, right? Two to four traffic lanes in the middle, two parking stripes, and then two sidewalks chopped under the buildings. This is a typical street in the developed world in the 21st century. But how come urban planning this radical could become so commonplace? Wait, what? Radical? Yes. What you see in front of you right now is the height of radicalism. It's a type of insanity that we just all kinda got used to over the years and never really stopped to consider its implications. It's also a very recent development, yet we all treat it as if some eternal status quo. Now do you see what I'm talking about? Let's do it this way. For you as a living, breathing human being, red is off limits, only green is for you. In an urban settlement built for human beings to live, you as a human being are banned from most of the public spaces. Think about that for a moment, let that sink in. Inside your city, you are banned from using most public spaces. And the only way you can use those spaces again is if you purchase a motor vehicle. And this is something very new. For as long as human settlements have existed, our streets used to be places of public congregation with additional transportation. Streets were places for us to socialize, to talk, walk, drink, eat, shop, hang out. In other words, to live our lives. This was the case for thousands of years. Until until about a hundred years ago, the early 20th century. At that point, cars started to become more and more accessible. Although nowhere near on today's level, the vast majority of people were not car owners and they weren't going to be either for a good while. Streets were for people still, the vast majority of people. But then, something happened. Something that was as ingenious as it was sinister. An instance of manufactured consent, so well executed it would put John Arbuckle's 1994 to shame. And the end result is you, looking out of your window, surveying this radical change, this fundamental shift which is contrary to human nature, and think nothing of it. How did this happen? Who was responsible? And what can we do to fix this mess? Let's find out after a brief word from today's sponsor, Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a daily newsletter designed for millennials and zoomers. Founded by two students about half a decade ago, Morning Brew enables you to keep in touch with the world of tech, startups, politics and business without having to trudge through multiple websites, multiple magazines, paywalls, warnings to turn off your ad blocker. Morning Brew spares you from all that by providing you a professionally curated newsletter. In it you'll find everything you Need to know that day, given to you in a brief but comprehensive format. Ah, so Harvard said goodbye to fossil investments, huh? Well, better late than never, I guess. What's this? Epic Games going at Apple? Regardless of who loses here, everyone else will win. Morning Brew lets you keep in touch with the world in five minutes or your money back. Well, actually, Morning Brew services are completely free. All you need to do is type in your email address, click the button, and you're done. You'll find the link to the subscription page in my description below. Thank you for checking out Morning Brew. Ads like this help support what I do. And now, back to the program. A hundred or so years ago, in the 1920s, cars began to appear on the streets in greater and greater numbers. And by virtue of being a new and expensive tech novelty, it was mostly wealthy people who owned them. And keep in mind that traffic rules as we know them today didn't exist yet. The way you drove was completely up to you. So we have a bunch of wealthy assholes in expensive and fast cars with no traffic rules driving onto pedestrian streets. And so predictably the result was a massive death toll. The result of a phenomenon which later came to be called joyriding. And believe it or not, the public was staunchly anti-car at this point. So car manufacturers had a big problem. Their cars were being portrayed as these murderous death machines, which they pretty much were at this point, and the consequences of this bad PR was a threat to the automaker's bottom line. So what can they do? They can't really change people's minds at this point. The obvious and negative consequences of motorization were there for anyone to see. And that was when players of the auto industry came up with an idea. An idea that was just as insidious as it was genius and effective. Their targets became your grandparents or great-grandparents depending on how old you are. At that point they were school age still and they started receiving a new type of education courtesy of the auto industry and their endless benevolence. For the sake of their safety children are thought to always look around before crossing the road because they are the ones who have to stop for traffic and not the other way around. And that's because streets belong to cars not people. And so entire generations of children grew up thinking this was the new norm. But in the meantime the old generation was very much alive still and they had some very different ideas about 
about how streets should be used. And they put up quite the fight against the auto industry and drivers. And they even scored some victories. But according to Peter Norton, the author of Fighting Traffic, the dawn of the motor age in the American city, the tide turned against the majority in 1923 when citizens of Cincinnati organized a referendum aiming to put governors on cars limiting their speed to 25 miles per hour. And this was the point when players of the auto industry decided to go all out. They realized that if this thing gets passed and becomes a national precedent, it'll become much more difficult to sell cars and they're gonna make a lot less money. And things went all downhill from there. To quote from this Bloomberg article titled The Invention of Jaywalking, local auto clubs and dealers sent letters to every individual with a car in the city, saying the rule would condemn the US to the fate of China, which they painted as the world's most backward nation. They even hired pretty women to invite men to head to the polls and vote against the rule. And the measure failed. They also got Detroit involved. The automakers banded together to help fight the Cincinnati rule, according to Norton, and they remained organized after that, he says. The industry lobbied to change the law, promoting the adoption of traffic statutes to supplant common law. The statutes were designed to restrict pedestrian use of the street and give primacy to cars. The idea of jaywalking, a concept that had not really existed prior to 1920, was enshrined in law. And this is the reason why even today, our streets belong to cars and not people. All of it can be traced back to the auto industry, with corporations using their wealth and power to subvert the democratic will of the people. Even today, in the 21st century, our streets are designed to serve corporate interest and not the people. For the sake of individualized transport and massive corporate profits, we are forced to endure all the negative consequences. The traffic hazard, the air pollution, the noise pollution, the loss of public space. These are all very bad things. And guess who's not suffering from them? And over here we have a picture of inner city Stuttgart, Germany. Stuttgart being the home of Daimler Group and Mercedes-Benz. Now, which one of these buildings do you think the Daimler leadership lives in? I mean, hey, this looks like the ideal place for a car company's leadership. There's like 14 traffic lanes all very close to the buildings. Now, this might come as a shock for you, but they seem to prefer different areas of the city. And over here we can see the Degeloch and Waldau areas of Stuttgart. In these places and the areas near them, your average size, nothing special, single-family homes cost between one and three million dollars. According to this local German newspaper, this is one of the most expensive areas of Stuttgart, offering its tenants calm and quiet, and proximity to green areas and the city center. They also describe it as a practical Daimler enclave. But hey, if you also want to raise your children in an area free of the negative aspects of motorization, all you need to do is buy a house in Waldau. That would be 1.2 million dollars, please, if you're lucky. And this is the reason why I fundamentally oppose urban motorization. It produces this bizarre and harmful hierarchy, where the wealthy in our society can pay money for things such as clean air, calm and quiet, access to green areas, and streets on which their children can safely play. All these used to be the standard for most people in cities. Now they come at a seven-digit premium. But health, space and environmental consequences are not the only ones we suffer from. There is also a social aspect, also known as atomization. As I've mentioned before, streets used to be places of public congregation and socialization right until cars took it over. And it was COVID-19 that really highlighted this problem. As soon as we didn't have the restaurants, the bars, the clubs, the yoga classes, many people became completely isolated, with no opportunities to meet others. Before the era of motorization, you would have known people from the street, a people living in your neighborhood, that is, because streets were places to hang out in, to stroll around, to do your thing, to have conversations with people, to socialize. But nowadays, with all the noise, the pollution, the crammed, narrow sidewalks, Streets became this temporary unpleasantness that we have to trudge through to get to the nice places. And all because we gave our streets to cars. So what is the solution? How do we fix this mess? One word. Superblocks. To date, superblocks are the most efficient ways of taking back our neighborhoods and making our streets fit for human habitation once again. The first superblock was established in Barcelona, Spain in 2016. And it turned out to be a massive success. So much so that now they're being expanded. Here's how it works. You take an area delimited by four major roads. And inside that area, you pedestrianize every single street. Of course, residents' cars and essential services can still drive in, but the streets are arranged in a way that you cannot go through the area. That means you will only drive into the superblock if you really have business there. The philosophy of this design is that inside a superblock, cars are only guests. Living inside a superblock encourages a more active, healthier lifestyle, which reduces obesity, diabetes, and other similar health issues. People will also live longer and healthier lives because of the lack of noise and air pollution. With superblocks, a tremendous amount of public space is freed up again, providing people with much needed places of public congregation. This reduces loneliness and thus increases mental health. Superblocks 
networks seem to be a great solution to all the problems brought about by mass motorization. So let's build more. Right now, Vienna is also joining this club with their first experimental superblock, oh, uh, I mean uh, Zupa Gretel, which is great. In the meantime, Paris has been doing a ton of stuff already, banning through traffic from the center, pedestrianizing the promenades, the list goes on. Now I think every major city should start doing this right now. Not only because it's a nice and beneficial thing to do, but also because pretty soon we'll have to do it, due to this thing called the, the oncoming, oncoming climate, climate catastrophe, catastrophe, where cities by 2050 will see a temperature increase of up to 8 degrees Celsius in their maximum temperature. Holy shit! And if this happens, which it really looks like it will, all our big black asphalt covered streets will turn into frying pans. Imagine hearing that your dog got hit by a car, but upon running out to the street only finding a piece of well done steak. The only way cities will be able to combat this temperature increase, the only way our cities will remain livable is through narrow streets with lots of shading, no black asphalt, and certainly no giant hunks of metal and plastic to absorb all the heat. So yeah, essentially climate resistant superblocks. And better sooner than later. And this can be achieved by banning most motor traffic inside cities and giving back public spaces to the people. And wouldn't that be nice? To sum up, if you hate hierarchy and dying of complications from heat strokes, you should support transitioning away from individual motor traffic. And I know that for some of you this might have sounded a bit radical or harsh, but I'm sorry, we have no choice. Since apparently we kind of just gave up on stopping extreme climate change, the least we can do is prepare for the consequences. Right. At any rate, thank you for watching and please like and subscribe and don't forget to check out my Patreon if you think this content is worth your money. And vote for politicians who are in favor of decongestion measures, please. And I'll be seeing you next time.